Ramesh Mashilkar uh, interviewed me for All India Radio. He asked me uh, in towards the end, who is my icon in India? And I told him my icon in India is Professor C. N. R. Rao. Professor C. N. R. Rao, a pioneer in many areas of research. A living legend in the field of solid state chemistry and material science. His work is extremely diverse and his creativity in science is prolific. A great team leader, a builder of great institutions, and a constant source of guidance to other people. He is a firm believer of providing a nurturing environment to other scientists. A true Indian at heart. Science, spirituality, and nationalism being his strongest source of inspiration in life. Professor Rao's achievement has been recognized all over the world. He is a recipient of all the topmost national and international awards and honors. He is the only Indian elected to all major scientific academies of the world. Many foreign universities had offered him attractive positions, freedom and facilities to continue research in the field of his choice. He decided to stay in India. And I understand lately that he gets more than 2,000 citations a year. Many scientists in India won't get this kind of um, uh, citations even for several years put together. I, I'm Indian. I'm Indian. It was 1945, end of the Second World War, and the growing intensity of the Indian freedom struggle. Speeches of Pandit Nehru and Gandhiji had a deep impact on Professor Rao's mind. Those magical days inspired every patriotic Indian and hence Professor Rao too. He actively participated in the freedom struggle. It is complete independence that we want. For those who have not met Nehru or not seen Nehru, they will not be able to understand the kind of magnetic personality he had. He was a great patriot, and also a man with great vision. To me, as a child, I was when I was ten years old. Gandhi was, uh, was 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 like the image of Jesus Christ or one of our saints. It was always like that. Even today, Gandhi's ideas for India, if I had followed most of them, I think maybe it would have been a much better India. I am not sure that we have done better than what Gandhi had for us. A movement for merging more than 600 princely states with the Indian Union had started in pre-independence era. Mysore was one such state. Professor Rao was fully convinced about the cause of democracy in free India and joined some of the processions demanding freedom. He even gave a few spirited speeches in Bangalore. <laughs> Mysore Deshi ke bera vektitya idea, vektitva idea Does it have an individuality of its own without India, this state? So this is the kind of thing we used to talk about. The Rao family, strong believers of the Madhva philosophy, admirers of doing good deeds and caring for the good of the society. In this background was born Chintamani Nagesa Ramchandra Rao on June 30, 1934 in Basadguri near Bangalore. His father, Nagesa Rao, had a degree in education and was a postgraduate in history. He worked in the education department of the old Mysore state. His mother, Nagamma, was well read despite the fact that in those days, girls hardly had an opportunity to attend school. In 1944, he passed the lower secondary examination in first class. Later, he joined Acharya Pakshala for higher education. 
the excellent teachers of this institution made chemistry interesting. He passed high school examination in first class at the age of 13 in 1947. Professor Rao joined the Central College in Bangalore for BSc with physics, chemistry and mathematics as principal subjects. At the tender age of 17, he passed BSc in first class in 1951. In spite of spectacular performances in all examinations, Professor Rao hated them. He even suffered nightmares. I get up from my sleep because I get a bad, terrible bad dreams actually about some about exams. And these nightmares, I guess, I, uh, uh, somebody said you, you get it because you, you are successful in those exams. Otherwise you won't get them. You know, even now I wake up suddenly think I'm going to take an exam for my uh, 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 school or BSc or RUM exam. And uh, I get up and uh, find that uh, uh, I'm, I'm no longer prepared. You know, it's one of those things. Following his teacher's advice, he decided to go to Banaras Hindu University in 1951. The journey to Banaras acquainted him with the great socio-cultural and linguistic diversity of India. Banaras, now Varanasi, was a spiritual experience for Professor Rao. In his formative years, visit to the sacred place like Ghats of the majestic Ganga, and the Vishwanath temple influenced him immensely. A feeling of tranquility and peace was invariably experienced. When I first went to Benares, I, I, I was a bit awed by that city. Uh, but slowly as time went on, I realized the essence of India is there. Even today it is so. You have to see Benares in a different way. Even today in its temples, I think it is a tremendous place. It is not the religious uh, reasons alone. It is much higher than religious uh, causes. So even today I feel uh, uh, wonderful when I go there. I go there whenever I can. And I, I also visit temples early in the morning, at 4 in the morning. <laughs> The Banaras Hindu University was founded by late Pandit Madan Mohan Malavya. A national university in the truest sense caters to the educational needs of students nationwide. The visionary Malavya intended that the university must help India progress. This university, acclaimed for its teaching in humanities, also witnessed subjects like science and technology seeking attention and focus then. At that time, it was a very, very important national university. It was truly a national university. In my entire MSc class, there was one boy from Uttar Pradesh. That's it. There were four from Maharashtra, four, three, four from Karnataka, Andhra, Tamil Nadu, Punjab. But it's a real national university. I don't think you will have such places anymore. But uh, it was a wonderful thing. So I got to know India through Benares. Books were a matter of fascination. Professor Rao read a variety of books on science apart from the regular textbooks. While in Benares, he happened to read the book which changed his perspective of chemistry, his favorite subject, drastically. It was written by the famous American chemist Linus Pauling. The book introduced a different concept in chemistry. Discovering the structuring and shapes of molecules and relating them to the properties of compounds was something totally different from what he had studied so far. Professor Rao thought of going for research in a similar area. That book itself uh, was a revolutionary book. In chemistry, nobody realized you can unify the varied observations of chemistry, properties of matter, based on understanding of the chemical bond in a particular way and he wrote, he, uh, he wrote that first book in the late 30s and I, I got hold of it when I was a student and uh, when I read it I thought look this is the kind of chemistry I should be doing you see. After completing MSc with first class Professor Rao left Banaras and went back to Bangalore in 1953. After a careful analysis he realized that continuing his study of modern chemistry in India was difficult. 
where can I do it? Because at that time, there was no way of doing it in India. It was very clear to me I have to leave India to learn this kind of chemistry, learn this kind of instrumentation, uh, you know, studying such problems and so on. So Linus Pauling, of course, immediately became my hero. He therefore decided to go abroad. He got admission with financial help from four American universities. He joined Purdue University with the idea of working with a specific professor from Pauling School. He left for the United States in 1954. Professor Rao started his doctoral thesis on electron diffraction with Professor Robert Livingston. He published several research papers on different aspects of spectroscopy and physical organic chemistry. He even designed new devices and instruments. Professor Livingston was appreciative of his students' insight into the subject and generously gave him an opportunity to work independently. He, he was my PhD supervisor in the sense you know, he didn't interfere with me. You know. He became a bit of an administrator and he said, well, why don't you do something very interesting as well, he said. Professor Rao received PhD in 1957. In spite of offers from many foreign universities in USA for postdoctoral research, he decided to work at University of California at Berkeley and joined it in 1958. It was here that he started getting recognition as a distinguished chemist. Despite an assured future in US, he returned to independent India, the India of his dreams. CNR joined the Indian Institute of Science on basic salary of 500 rupees per month. Later, he married Indumati in 1960. Indu's father, Narayan Swami, was an engineer and her mother, Leelabai, a housewife. The only child of her parents, Indu, was a graduate in English literature from the Central College of Mysore. Hindu always wished to marry someone who could provide an intellectual companionship. Like all young girls, when we used to talk about uh, the type of person one would like to get married, I always used to say I want to marry a man who can be a challenge mentally, academically, and who would share a lot of interest with me because I was always interested in music, reading, and things like that. And it just so happened I was. I mean, blessed, I should say. Rao joined IISC as a lecturer. He wrote a monograph on ultraviolet and visible spectroscopy using molecular orbital notations. In 1960, his first book, titled Ultraviolet and Visible Spectroscopy, was published. When Rao needed some references for his book, Sir C. V. Raman helped him get some journals from his personal library. The book was a major breakthrough. When I was writing my first book, I needed some references. Those references were all in Raman Institute. When, when I went to ask him, he said, oh yeah, sure, I'll look for you. And he gave me, once he brought a book all the way by car, he came, came to my house and gave it to me. One morning, there was Sivi Raman bring, coming, bringing me a book. Uh, he was an extraordinary, and if you liked a person, if he thought you were a sincere person, he would go do anything for you. Professor Rao accepted an offer of associate professorship from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, in 1963. Then the new institute in Kanpur with American support started, a new IIT at Kanpur, and with uh, MIT, Purdue, Berkeley, Ohio State, Princeton, they were all MIT, they were all in Caltech, they were all involved in setting that up. And they offered me a faculty position. His entire work in Kanpur can be termed as a struggle to achieve excellence in a climate of mediocrity. His new idea for curriculum were encouraged and well supported by the then director of IIT, Dr. P. K. Kelker, who made him head of the department. He, at the age of 29, here I was, he said, you, you will be the head of the department. And there are others actually, I mean, of course, no, a bit older than I am. Maybe five, six older, but they they know you are the to be the And then you know who does that? And then within six to eight months, he may, may be a full professor. I went as an associate professor. Within a year over, I was made a full professor and head of the department. In addition to the introduction of a two-year MSc course after BSc, he helped to start a new integrated five-year MSc program. Besides establishing MTech and PhD courses, he made the material science research a major thrust area in the institute. His morale received a significant boost in the form of a personal letter from Sir C. V. Raman. 
And in fact, when he saw my second book, he wrote this uh, big famous letter. Everybody knows about that. He is saying, you know, dear Dr. Rao, I would like, I have seen this book. I, I would like you to be a member of the fellow of the academy. If you have no objection, I will take the necessary steps, etc., etc. He, he nominated me and in the, at the age of 29, 30, I became a fellow of the Indian Academy of Science uh, because of him. Uh, in fact, that is my first recognition in life, uh, in scientific world. In 1974, Professor Rao was invited to join the University of Oxford as Commonwealth Visiting Professor. It was Professor Rao's first visit to England and hence the first exposure to her people and culture. Though he returned to Kanpur, he was thinking of leaving the place. Satish Dhawan was a very good friend of mine who was a director in Bangalore. He said, no, 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 don't go. You can't go. I have always been thinking of you. You should never have left Bangalore, you see. I knew him when I was here before. You we are very good friends. He said, no, you must come back. What is it you want? What, what do you want? That's what he asked. I want nothing. I want the freedom to build a new kind of center, new kind of department uh, in my area. So he said, okay, that is, that is what I think we can do that. So next thing you know, he, I got a, nothing much except a, a, a senior professorship uh, to do build a new department in chemistry. Once again, Professor Rao joined the Indian Institute of Science in 1976. In 1982, he was selected as the Fellow of the Royal Society, London. In 1984, he was appointed as the Director of Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. During Professor Rao's tenure as Director, various activities in the Institute expanded like never before. The Institute of Science, Bangalore itself, if you had seen the facilities that were available for scientific work in Institute of Science, before he became the director. And five years after he was director, you would have noticed a sea change, a very major change, not ordinary change, not incremental change, because he worked for it. A unique feature of his style of administration was the open door policy. Known for his sharp memory, Professor Rao knew all the academic staff members and employees by their names. I never wrote a note. As, and to anybody as a director. I would call you and say, call him. I say, will you do that? Maybe next week I would like this to be finished. Next week. Yes, sir, they would say. I would call next week, have you done it? And all my discussion was based on oral, uh, direct, in fact, that direct relationship with every worker. I knew names of several thousand employees in the institute, and the, all the faculty, a large number of students, and the personal relationship was one that made me uh, whatever I was worth. I would walk. I never used a car in the campus. Even if the car, most distant camp, you know, it would be one and a half kilometers maybe sometimes, long walk. I would walk that distance. I would always walk to the campus, never use the car. So I was a walking director. If you look at all the scientists in India, all right, Professor Rao is the only one. You ask him about the directory of the most promising young scientists, writing down the names of top 100 young scientists of the country. I bet he's the only one who will be able to give you that. Professor Rao's contribution was honored at home and abroad during his term as director. His contribution to the field of solid state chemistry and material science is remarkable for its great diversity. He has uh, contributed a lot to the field of high TC superconductivity, to the field of uh, transition metal oxides, the property and phenomena, structure, new materials, new oxides. So he has contributed immensely to those fields and he is regarded very highly in the world for his contributions in, in these fields. He is a global pioneer who had designed and characterized several novel oxide systems. In materials chemistry, if we want to call it that way, you know, in high TC superconductors, in uh, magnetic materials like uh, colossal magnetoresistance materials, uh, in fullerenes, in carbon and other nanotubes. Professor Rao has been a great leader, particularly when it comes to work on uh, uh, carbon nanotubes, for example. He was the first one to uh, demonstrate uh, a T-junction and so on. Uh, I believe that carbon nanotubes do have a tremendous technological future. We are still exploring uh, its science, trying to understand why they work the way they do. Uh, but I'm quite uh, sure that in large number of uh, 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 devices, uh, they are going to play a very critical role. 
he is a role model with a combination of friendliness and guiding spirit for his pupils. I have grown to become from that student to a teacher and uh, continuously interacting with uh, Professor CNR who I continue to hold as my teacher. Uh, the value system that has uh, really has rubbed on all of us and on me uh, in some ways that I can possibly say. Uh, usually he makes us collaborate with many people from uh, various institutes with very uh, various backgrounds uh, which uh, helps us not only learning many techniques but also uh, as a whole develops our personality. I have never found uh, CNR on any day being absent from the department not working continuously, not writing something. These are all great things. One of the things that always impressed me is the way he manages time for everybody. Like he has some 20 odd students, but still each and every student he'll be meeting in alternate days. He's one person who can perform like 20 tasks at the same time and the perfection in which he does it is just excellent. He remembers things very perfectly. Like for example, if you're having an, any discussion and some of the work has been previously done or something related has been done. He knows for sure who has done it, which year and he promptly removes a book and he'll show us the exact page on which it has been done. And I believe I have tried to emulate that, that particular I think and write and interact with the students, constantly interact with students. And this is a tradition and I believe now at least for one generation it has been passed on. If any of my students were to become teachers and do the same thing, I think it is a tradition that has been passed on. The Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research is a premier research institute in the country. It was established in 1989 to commemorate the birth centenary of Pandit Nehru, promoting intense scientific research and training at the highest level in frontier areas of science and engineering. Recognized as a deemed university by the UGC in 2002, the center maintains close academic collaboration with the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Professor Rao, the founder president of the center, held the office from 1989 to 1999. He is presently the honorary president of the center. I have seen that new center in Japan, which was all like ruins. Not a blade of grass, as we normally say, grew there. I mean, some spray. And today, it has such a verdant atmosphere. How? And it's also funded by Government of India to celebrate centenary of Jawaharlal Nehru. It's simple beauty. And the labs are also designed elegantly. And I know how hard he works in creating. It's entirely his creation. The center has seven units for the study of chemistry and physics of materials, evolutionary and organismal biology and genetics, and theoretical science. The educational technology unit is set up mainly to provide innovative educational material for the use of students and teachers. Professor Rao and Indumati Rao, along with their colleagues, are deeply involved in the functioning of the unit. The main purpose of this was to prepare interactive material both for children and teachers because he felt that uh, both the method of teaching and uh, learning would be very different in the 20th century and therefore it was necessary for us to provide some material available, make some material available so that both the teachers and the students uh, could use that. Uh, learning science, of course you all are learning science, so for you may say why is this learning science? Well, you may read science in the school, you may even pass an exam, you may get a degree, you may get a PhD, you may be a professor, but still you may not have learned science. That's the problem. Professor Rao could have easily got into the centers of power, but he stayed away and instead gave his counsel to the powers whenever required. Many scientific institutions and organizations are flourishing with the active participation, encouragement and guidance of Professor Rao. Well, I have worked actually with about four or five prime ministers closely. Uh, with Mrs. Gandhi, I was much too young, but I worked with her in the sense I was in many committees, I used to know her, I was in science planning in the country as a member of many important uh, national bodies. 
uh, our governing bodies of CSIR. Where I used to see her all the time. And uh, so the relationship was different. Uh, what I remember most about his uh, uh, SACPM days is, first of all, his vision. He always thought ahead of his time. Uh, and uh, in fact, he would beat all of us in thinking. That was one. Secondly, his boldness. You know, uh, he did not mince words. I also have closely worked with him as a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee to the Cabinet. And I think when he chairs these kind of committees, you can see the breadth and depth of the knowledge that he carries with him. And he guides the deliberations of the committee in an extraordinary way, coming out of the very vast knowledge. He's not only that he keeps track of his own subject, he is very active in his own subject, but also he makes sure that he knows the overall development in science. He knows the overall developments in technology, the relationship to development. So there is something holistic about his understanding of science, technology and development. Uh, but uh, on a one-to-one -one basis, uh, very closely I worked with Rajiv Gandhi for five years. And uh, even after he lost the election, I used to work with him because he was interested uh, in a plan for India if we came back to power. So what is very significant as a scientist, he is productive, he is absolutely well networked, so the scientific community all over the world knows about him, respect him, and uh, they would like to have him in their groups uh, periodically. So all that is... So that these are all the good hallmarks of a good scientist. About 40 countries with over 1.2 billion people are termed as the least developed countries. About 100 countries are placed in the category of the developing countries. The distinguished group of scientists from these countries took a bold initiative and founded the Third World Academy of Science in 1983. This academy is dedicated to encourage the pursuit of scientific excellence in the South. Professor Rao is the founding member of the academy and the driving force behind the growth and development of the academy. He was elected as the president of the academy for a three-year term and again for another term in 2003. The kind of leadership he has been able to give the Third World Academy of Sciences is enormous. I was there in Trieste recently uh, when we had our uh, uh, annual meeting and I could quite clearly see how he was revered uh, by the scientists uh, from uh, uh, the uh, third world and how he is driving a special agenda to move uh, uh, third world. In fact, he has had uh, the bold uh, uh, initiative of even changing the name of the third world academy of science. Two, three years back, he wrote a letter to me that uh, can ISRO build a small satellite uh, which could be dedicated to the third world and uh, this could uh, demystify the space uh, for many countries who do not have the privilege of conducting space program because they are expensive and technologically complex for those people to develop the necessary manpower resource. And I think uh, we, we took that uh, input and uh, took the cue and I am sure that the present uh, dispensation of ISRO will follow it up, they may make a presentation to him as the president and I am sure that uh, that will be his uh, lasting contribution. Uh, mainly classical music. That is a very wonderful effect and uh, uh, you know whatever you, worries you, however depressed you are or however, whatever that may be not so pleasant, uh, music kind of somehow takes care of it. I think it is a tremendous effect on your mind. Uh, there's no doubt in, uh, at all that uh, uh, music is something that is not only soothing, that even actually has a psychological or philosophical or some kind of a effect on people's uh, minds, so their thinking gets affected. Never a dull moment. It's always exciting. Maybe, I'm not saying it's always, have, you know, we're always bubbling with joy, and this, but it has been a very, very interesting year. Well, my wife uh, and family have been a great support, my wife particularly. Uh, she's always been with me in everything I've done. And she also enjoys reading and so on. And uh, she's herself interested as a professional, as an educationist, as a teacher. We are very close friends, apart from being husband and wife. We uh, exchange lots of things. Uh, every evening, for example, even when I was working. Uh, for such a busy man, and a uh, man so involved in his research, he would always ask, how was your day, what did you do, and things like that. Professor Sienna Rao, 
has published more than 1400 research papers and written more than 37 books and has guided more than 130 students for PhD. I started my research in 1951. So that, to that extent, I have been doing scientific research for 53 years. Uh, but as a full-time professor and so on, uh, it is more like 45 to 46 years. The Linus Pauling professorship that he holds will be with him till the last day of his life. Lifetime professorship. Professor C.N.R. Rao, a lifetime professor.